So, welcome to the third in our short introduction to MPC. Today, what we're going to look, be looking at is some coding theory and the secret sharing schemes, which kind of derive from them. And in this um, uh, episode, what we're going to be doing is looking at specifically at Reed Solomon encoding. And then later on, we're going to generalize that to other forms of coding theory and other forms of secret sharing schemes. Okay, so what is a Reed Solomon code? Well, Reed Solomon codes and Shamir secret sharing are inter intertwined. So what we have is a Reed Solomon code is defined by two integers, um, n and t. n is the in the in the coding theory is the number of elements in the code word, and t is in some sense related to how much error correction or how much error detection we can have. In particular we can um, detect n minus t minus 1 errors and we can correct n minus t minus 1 over 2 errors. So we have uh, uh, one value for detecting errors and one value for correcting errors. And we, these are defined over a finite field. Now particularly with Shamir secret sharing and Reed Solomon codes, we require the finite field to have more than n elements, and that's going to be a key issue later on. So, how is a Reed Solomon code defined? Well, what we do is we take our finite field of q elements and we look at the set of all polynomials of degree less than or equal to t. So, this set here. Okay, so how many elements does this have? This has um, q to the t plus 1 elements. So, that each one of those uh, elements is going to define a code word. Okay, but the actual code words are given by the evaluation of these polynomials at n points in the field. And this is one of the reasons why we need uh, q to be bigger than n. So we evaluate the policy. If suppose that q was, was prime and bigger than n, we would evaluate the polynomial at 1, evaluate the polynomial 2, and so on, until we evaluated the n. And that would be our code word. So we can th what we do is we think of f, the polynomial, as the message and C as the code word. And there's clearly a redundancy in this representation. So what is that redundancy? Well, how many bits of information do we need to encode a polynomial? Well, we have T plus one uh, uh, coefficients, and each coefficient is a size log to the base two of Q. So, well, you know, first order approximation, we need T times log two Q bits of information. It's actually T plus one times log two Q, but Let's not worry about what's a log 2q between friends. Okay, so it's t times log 2q. But the total amount of um, data needed to represent this information in the code word is we have these n elements, the evaluations of the polynomial at the points 1 to n, and each one of those evaluations takes log 2q. So we actually are representing t, roughly t times log 2q bits of information in n times log 2q bits. So there's clearly a redundancy. And this redundancy is what makes coding theory work. Another way of thinking about this, which is kind of helpful, suppose you wanted to have this, this you wanted to evaluate a cubic function at seven points. We kind of see that this is what we do. Of course, this doesn't happen in a finite field if this only works over the reals, but imagine this um, is, is kind of what's happening, okay? So you actually output this point, this point, this point, this point, this point, this point, and this point, and there are seven pieces of information which actually encode the four pieces of information in the cubic uh, polynomial. Okay, so how do we recover data? So given a code word, a received code word, the evaluation of the polynomial one to n, and assume no errors have occurred, how do we recover the underlying uh, polynomial? Well, that's just basically inverting a linear system. So we could express the coefficient, the, the first element of the code was C1 as this um, sum, so the evaluation of one, and so on down to Cn. And that's a linear system. Basically, it defines a matrix, which is um, n, an n row by t row matrix, and we just have to invert that linear system. In fact, this matrix is what's going to be, is the van der Mond matrix, but let's not worry about that. Actually, we can do it more efficiently. We don't actually have to do linear algebra because we can actually do that inversion because it's related to the van der Bohm matrix symbolically. So what we can do is we define these so-called delta i of x values, which is the polynomial um, called 
uh, generated by all the monomials except for the kind of the monomial at i, okay, suitably scaled. And we have the, the following properties that delta i, when evaluated at i, gives us the value 1. And delta i, because we stick 1 in here, and the 1 minus j ca uh, cancels with the 1 minus j, so we get a product of 1s, and so delta i of i equals 1. Okay, what happens at delta i of j? Well, at delta i of j, we'll certainly, if j is not equal up to i, we certainly get a 0. Okay, for these are for all the j between 1 and n not equal to i. And the degree of this polynomial is n minus 1. So this is a kind of cool properties. And Lagrange interpolation is essentially applying the Chinese remainder theorem to these kind of polynomials. And so what we get is we get the Lagrange interpolation is that if we just take these values ci that we got from the code word, multiply them by these polynomials delta i, we actually get the original polynomial out. Okay, so that's kind of a magic formula that we can use to recover data, recover the original polynomial. Okay, so what happens if we get an error? So when we get an error, remember these, these delta i's that we're computing here have degree n minus 1, but the original polynomial only has degree t. So what happens if we get the real data, the top coefficients will all cancel each other out and we'll actually get a genuine polynomial of degree t here. But if we've got an error, if, for example, the third element in the code word was sent wrong, then that resulting combination will not be of the correct degree. So when you do the combination, you will see that you get a polynomial which isn't of degree t, it's of degree greater than t, and so you know you've got an error. And so how can we detect if errors have occurred? Well, if the number of errors is, is less than t, and which is itself less than n minus n over 2, then we can detect all errors. So this n over 2 is kind of is a kind of crucial, crucial number that you've seen in, in a previous lecture, and this is where this comes in, is that we can detect all errors because we know this polynomial, these upper coefficients will, when we do the Lagrange interpolation, will not cancel each other out. But how do we recover from errors? So we don't just want to detect them, we want to recover them. Well, if we want to recover from errors, we need more information. So one way of, uh, so what we need is we need that the number of errors has got to be much, much smaller. So instead of being um, less than n over 2, it's actually got to be less than n minus t minus 1 over 2. Okay. So and how would we recover errors? Well, the naive way of doing this is actually we try all possible subsets of size n minus e and then try to find an interpolating polynomial of degree t. However, that's a very inefficient, that's very exponential in terms of complexity. So what we actually use is we use the Berlekamp welsh algorithm to um, execute this kind of error correction algorithm kind of in a more efficient manner. So we're not going to cover that here, but this is standard in any standard textbook on coding theory. But the cool thing that what we're interested in is we can use read solomon codes to define a secret sharing scheme, and that is exactly the Shamir secret sharing scheme. So what we do is, is we're going to map the secrets S that we want to share to polynomials. And we're going to map each secret to a polynomial where the secret is the constant term. Okay, so if you evaluate the polynomial at zero, you actually get the secret you're trying to uh, share. And then what we do is we share the polynomial itself amongst the n parties by creating the code word associated to the Reed solomon code. So in other words, the first party gets f of 1, which corresponds to the first element in the Reed solomon code word, and the nth party gets f of n, that corresponds to the last element in the Reed solomon code word. And so each party gets a different share. But then reconstruction is easy, because reconstruction is actually easier than reconstructing the code word, in uh, the, the message in Reed solomon Remember, in Reed Solomon, the thing we're trying to encode is actually of is the polynomial, which is t plus one coefficients. But in Shamir sharing, what we're trying to do with secret sharing is we're actually only sharing one value, the element in the finite field. Okay. So to evaluate what to reconstruct, what we do is we evaluate that polynomial at zero, and if we look at what our previous method was. 
we just then have delta i of zero, which is a constant. So we just have to maintain these constants and then just form the dot product to recover the secret. And in fact, any t plus one parties can recover the secret. So we just need to, we'd have to change the delta i slightly, but we just have t plus one parties, they can recover the secret. Okay, so this is what we mean by a threshold secret sharing scheme is that there is a threshold of parties, in this case t plus one, who can recover the secret. And why can they recover the secret? Because the polynomial is of degree t, therefore it's defined by t plus one pieces of information. And so if they have, you have t plus one pieces of information, you can recover the polynomial, and so you can recover s. However, suppose you have less than t pieces of information. So if you have less than t pieces of information, that could be any polynomial which is consistent with those two pieces of information. So there's one degree of freedom left, and that degree of freedom is actually the secret. So if you have less than t plus one, strictly less than t plus one um, pieces of information, then the secret is information theoretically secure. There is no way you can find anything out about the secret, even if you had infinite computing power. Okay, so how are we gonna work this out in um, in, in our protocols. Okay, so what we want is we want the honest parties do not reveal their shares to anyone unless they want them to. But a passive adversary controls a subset and wants to learn the secret. So what does this mean? Well, this means that the number of adversaries must be strictly less than t. Okay, because we just said if he has t plus 1, the adversary has t plus one, they can recover. So if the adversaries, if we want the adversaries only to learn information they should learn, then the number of adversaries must be less than or equal to t. Okay. However, we also require that the honest parties have to be able to recover the secret. So if the number of, so the number of honest parties, how many honest parties do we have? Well, we have n minus the number of adversarial parties, and they've got to be able to recover the secret. So n minus a, number of elements in A has to be bigger than T, which we just said also has to be greater than or equal to the number of elements in A. So if you combine that together, we actually get that the number of things in the average, number of parties in the adversary set has to be strictly less than N over two, which is exactly the same error detection of reed solomon codes, and also is exactly the same bound that we had in the first lecture where we discussed what, uh, what uh, adversary structures, threshold adversary structures we could cope with if we had passively secure MPC, pro information theoretically secure MPC protocols. So these things are all intimately related. Okay, now let's assume what happens when an adversary lies about its shares. Well, the, a lying about your shares is, is the same as what happens in Reed solomon codes when you actually need, you get a code word in and there's been an error introduced. Now in, in coding theory, those errors are randomly introduced but in MPC, these errors are adversarially introduced. So how can we recover? Well, we can recover if the number of errors introduced were less than n minus t minus one all over two. We had that, that was the, using the Bernoulli massey algorithm. So we can recover the secret and recover from errors if t is strictly less than n minus two times a, number set in elements in a. But again, to maintain security, we lead a to be strictly less than t. So combining this inequality with this inequality, we get the number of elements in the adversary set must be strictly less than n over 3, which is, again, exactly the same as the error correcting bound for, um, essentially, for read sum encoding, and corresponds to the bound that we had in the first lecture where we talked about what you could achieve for robust, actively secure MPC in the honest, in the information theoretic setting. So these things are all infinitely, intimately related. So we said these can be expressed as, as linear algebra. So we're, we're going to see in the next lecture why I suppose. So let's, why is this linear algebra? Okay, so to generate the, mat uh, the code word, remember we had this matrix. That was the hidden matrix we had when we were solving these linear systems. So what we can say is that Shamir is defined by this linear scheme. It's defined by a matrix of size n by t plus 1 and a vector v, which is 1, 0, 0. So this v corresponds to the fact that the secret is going to be embedded in the first coefficient. So how do we do sharing? 
what we do is that for, if we want to share a secret s, we pick a random vector k in t plus 1 elements over q, fq, such that the dot product of this random vector and the tar what's called the target vector is equal to s, the secret. And then we define the shares by s equals m times k. Okay? So, so Shamir secret sharing is an example of what we call a linear secret sharing scheme because this is what it's a linear secret sharing scheme is. So Shamir is a linear secret sharing scheme. What does that mean? It means that there is a matrix such that the shares are defined by the matrix times a random vector where the vector is constrained by a dot product with another vector called the target vector which should give you the output of the secret you're trying to, sh to share. We can define the parity checks matrix of the code generated by the linear code M. And we can see that a set of shares are valid if we can just, if we just compute the parity check matrix times the set of shares and ch checking whether that's equal to the zero vector. So error detection is the parity check matrix of the underlying code. So again, we see a link between the underlying coding theory and error detection in the secret sharing scheme. So what this means is, and this is this is kind of cool, if we've got an MPC protocol and we, and we share the secrets in the MPC protocol by secret sharing, by Shamir secret sharing, and if we receive n shares and we know the threshold is less than, uh, and t is less than n over 2, strictly less, we know, we can know someone is lying by just checking the parity check matrix. Okay, so we can just abort, but we can't recover the secret. And if we abort, we do not know who cheated. However, if we receive n shares and t is less than n over three, we can know if someone is lying and we do not need to abort because at that point we can recover the secret. We can recover what should have been, if we receive those n shares and one of the adversarial parties is lying, we can just, we know who they are, we can dispense with them and recover the secret in any case. But what's kind of interesting is that if we receive only T shares, we can reconstruct this A secret, but we don't know if it's necessarily the correct one. So imagine we had Shamir sharing with three parties and t equals one. Then we have Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And to recover a secret, I only need to take data from Charlie. I don't have to take that data from Bob. So I can reduce the total amount of data being sent, okay, by only receiving data from Charlie. And Bob will only receive data from me. And Charlie will only receive data from Bob. So in a three-party protocol, we can basically send reconstruct shares in a round-robin man round manner, this therefore dramatically reducing the amount of communication. So we can reconstruct the shares, and if everyone's honest, we can, they will be consistent. Everyone will recover the same shares. But if we have a lot of these things to check, but if something could go wrong, okay, so when we reconstruct, because I'm only accepting data from Charlie, Charlie might lie to me. Okay, but what we now do is that we use this data coming in and we reconstruct the share ve vector, maintain a consistent hash carrying on, and then we can check whether these openings are all consistent. So if we want to, so in summary, if we want to open a lot of values to each other in an MPC protocol, we don't actually have to send all of the data to everybody we can restrict the data that we send such that we only send just enough data to reconstruct the secret. If we can reconstruct the secret, we can also reconstruct the shares that we used of the parties. So if I get the data from B, party B, I could reconstruct what party C should have seen as well, what their share should have been. Now, because I, I can do that, I can then take a hash of that particular value and keep a running hash through the protocol. And only at the end of the protocol do we have to then verify that all the hashes agree. 
So if I wanted to, if I'm in my protocol, I require to open a million secret sharings. I open these million secret sharings, not by everybody sending each other a million pieces of data, but by just sending enough data that I can recover my shares and that Bob can recover his, or Charlie his, and Dave his, and whatever. But then we then check consistency, not by using the error, um, the parity check matrix, we use consistency by reconstructing the shares that of the parties that haven't engaged with me in the protocol. So I'm recon reconstruct Charlie's shares. And then at the end of the protocol, we do a comparison of the hash values. It's like, uh, basically a consensus protocol on the hash values. And if something's wrong, then we detect it then. So this is a, a very, this gives us a very fast way of checking many, many, many openings at once. And this forms the basis of many secret sharing based uh, active security with a ball MPC protocols. And it's called what's called the hash check procedure because we check via hashing. Okay, so that was our um, summary of smear secret sharing and how this maps into Reed Solomon codes and how we check uh, whether these shares are correct. So we check them in with either by using error correction and then we know who's been lying to us. We can check them, if we receive shares from everybody, we can check the shares are consistent by using the parity check matrix. But this is inefficient if we want to open large numbers of sharings within a protocol. So in that method, of, in there, in that situation, what we do is we only share, reshare enough data for everybody to reconstruct the shares maybe wrongly. But then at the end, we check that the reconstructed sharings were correct by using a running hash value. So in the next um, episode, what we're going to do is look at this in more detail and generalize this. So we're not just going to be looking at the specific case of Shamir secret sharing. We're going to generalize Shamir secret sharing to a much wider class of secret sharing schemes to be able to cope with all possible linear secret sharing schemes. And they're going to form the basis of our MPC protocols.